Imagine this, a warship so massive it rivals a skyscraper laid on its side, bigger than America's newest Ford-class carrier but with a secret. It doesn't need to stop for fuel. Instead, it runs on nuclear power, giving it the ability to circle the globe for years without ever refueling. In 2024, satellites captured what looked like this exact ship taking shape in a Chinese shipyard. Soon after, a model leaked, and what people noticed was shocking. The design had no chimney, no funnel. And in the world of warships, that usually means only one thing, nuclear propulsion. If this is true, then China's so-called Type 004 isn't just another carrier. It's a floating nuclear-powered base at sea, something only two other countries have ever achieved, the United States and France. And that raises the big question, how did China, with less than two decades of carrier experience, get here so fast? To answer that, Let's rewind the clock and trace how China went from its very first carrier to the edge of nuclear power in record time. China's aircraft carrier journey didn't begin that long ago. In fact, the story really starts in 2012, when the Liaoning, an old Soviet-era carrier that China bought and refurbished, officially entered service. Back then, many Western analysts dismissed it as little more than a training ship. But only five years later, in 2017, China launched its first home-built carrier, the Shandong. This was a turning point. It showed that China wasn't just repairing old hardware. It was now building its own. Then in 2022, China unveiled the Fujian, a massive leap forward. For the first time, the People's Liberation Army Navy deployed an advanced electromagnetic catapult system, a technology the U.S. Navy itself only introduced recently on its newest carriers. Think about that Pace 3 carriers, in just over a decade. The U.S., by comparison, took almost a century to move from its first carrier in 1922 to its modern Ford class. China compressed that timeline into just 20 years. This rapid progress left many people stunned, but it also set the stage for a debate. If China could move this quickly with conventional carriers, could it really jump to nuclear power so soon? And that's where the skeptics come in. People who believe the leap to nuclear carriers is just too big, too fast to be true. Not everyone was convinced China could pull this off. In fact, for years, most experts argued that a nuclear-powered carrier was still far out of reach. Why? First, there's the technology gap. Nuclear propulsion isn't just about putting a reactor in a ship. It requires miniaturizing nuclear plants, ensuring they can run safely for decades, and training crews to operate them in the middle of the ocean. Even Russia, which has nuclear submarines, never mastered nuclear carriers at scale. Second, there's the cost problem. A U.S. Ford-class nuclear carrier costs around $13 billion to build. Add the escort ships, aircraft, and maintenance, and the lifetime cost can exceed $100 billion. Many argued that China would rather spend that money on cheaper conventional carriers, submarines, or hypersonic missiles. And third, there's the risk factor. Nuclear carriers are floating reactors. A single accident at sea could create an environmental and political disaster, something China, which already faces scrutiny over nuclear safety, would want to avoid. So for a long time, the consensus was simple. China might dream of a nuclear carrier, but realistically, it wouldn't happen anytime soon. But then, the evidence started piling up. Leaks, satellite photos, and design clues that suggest China might already be breaking those limits. In 2024, the skepticism began to crack. It started with a curious leak. Scale models of China's next-generation carrier surfaced online. At first glance, it looked like a natural evolution of the Fujian. But sharp-eyed analysts noticed one missing detail. No smokestack, no funnel. That tiny absence was a huge clue. Every conventionally powered carrier, from the Liaoning to the Fujian, has a funnel to vent exhaust. Remove that, and the only explanation is a propulsion system that doesn't burn fuel. Like nuclear. Then came the satellite images. Commercial satellites spotted a massive new hull under construction in Jiangnan Shipyard, Shanghai. The ship looked longer, wider, and heavier than the Fujian, big enough to house a nuclear plant and the support systems that come with it. Even Chinese state-linked media began dropping hints. In late 2024, several outlets spoke of a fourth-generation carrier with unlimited endurance and next-level breakthroughs. In Beijing's careful language, those phrases often mean far more than they seem. Piece by piece, the puzzle began to fit together. 
what was once dismissed as rumor, started to look like a real possibility that China's next carrier, the so-called Type 004, could be nuclear-powered. But technology isn't just about power plants. It's about how planes take off and land. And here, the catapult system is the beating heart of the story. To understand why this matters, let's talk about catapults. On older carriers like China's Liaoning and Shandong, planes launch using a ski jump ramp at the front of the deck. It looks dramatic, jets blasting off into the sky, but it comes with limits. Heavier aircraft like fully loaded fighters or early warning planes can't take off effectively. That means shorter range, fewer weapons, and weaker surveillance. The United States solved this decades ago with steam catapults and more recently the email system, the electromagnetic aircraft launch system, now used on America's Ford class carriers. This allows planes to launch with more power, greater frequency, and less stress on their frames. In 2022, China shocked the world by debuting its own electromagnetic catapult on the Fujian. This was a direct technological leap, skipping past the steam era entirely. With emails, China can now launch heavier, more advanced jets, and even prepare for the future of unmanned combat drones at sea. Why is this important for the nuclear question? Because electromagnetic catapults are power-hungry. A conventional diesel-powered carrier struggles to generate the megawatts needed. A nuclear plant, however, can feed the system easily and still have energy left over for radars, lasers, or rail guns. So if the Type 004 is nuclear, the catapult isn't just an accessory. It's the system that makes the entire carrier design make sense. And the real shock is how fast this carrier could actually move once at sea. Because nuclear propulsion isn't just about unlimited range. One of the biggest advantages of nuclear propulsion is speed. Not just raw speed, but sustained speed. Conventional carriers like China's Liaoning or Shandong rely on diesel or gas turbines. That means they need to refuel after a few weeks at sea. It also limits how long they can maintain top speed because fuel burns fast when you push a ship that large. Now compare that to a nuclear carrier. The United States Navy's nuclear-powered carriers can cruise at over 30 knots, roughly 55 kilometers per hour, and hold that pace for months if needed. And they can do it without stopping to refuel for 20 years, since their reactors are designed to last decades before servicing. This changes everything in naval strategy. A nuclear carrier can dash across oceans faster, reposition to hotspots quicker, and keep pressure on rivals without relying on supply ships. It's the difference between a sprinter who tires after a lap and a marathon runner who just keeps going at sprinting speed. For China, that would mean the ability to project power far beyond the South China Sea into the Indian Ocean, the Pacific, and even toward the Middle East without worrying about fuel lines. But speed is only one part of the puzzle. The real question is, what exactly will China's nuclear carrier carry? What kind of air wing will give it teeth? A carrier is only as powerful as the aircraft it can launch. So what will China's nuclear carrier actually carry? Right now, the backbone of China's naval aviation is the J-15 fighter jet, basically a Chinese version of Russia's Su-33. It's capable, but heavy, and the ski jump carriers limited what it could do. On the Fujian and beyond, catapults changed the game. Fully loaded J-15s can now launch with more weapons and fuel. But Beijing isn't stopping there. Engineers are already testing the J-35 stealth fighter a carrier-based cousin of the land-based J-31. Think of it as China's answer to America's F-35C, stealthy, more advanced, and designed for catapult launches. Then there's the KJ-600 early warning plane, which looks strikingly similar to the United States Navy's E-2 Hawkeye. This aircraft can stay in the sky for hours, scanning hundreds of kilometers with its radar, giving the carrier group eyes far beyond the horizon, and perhaps the most futuristic peace carrier-based drones. China has been experimenting with unmanned combat aircraft that could fly off carriers, strike targets, or act as loyal wingmen to manned fighters. Put together, this means China's next carrier won't just be a bigger ship. It'll be a floating airbase with stealth fighters, surveillance planes, and drones, rivaling the United States Navy's most modern wings. But all that power comes with a catch. Nuclear carriers are, honestly, eye-wateringly expensive. And here's where the money question gets serious. Building a nuclear carrier isn't just about steel and technology, it's about money, lots of it. To give a bit of perspective, 
America's newest nuclear carrier, the USS Gerald R. Ford, cost about $13 billion to build. Add in its air wing, escort ships, and, you know, a lifetime of maintenance, and the real price tag rises to over $100 billion. That's actually more than the GDP of some small countries. For China, the challenge is pretty similar. A conventional carrier like the Fujian is already massively expensive, but a nuclear-powered carrier requires even more. Specialized shipyards, nuclear-qualified engineers, reactor components, and an entirely new logistics network for training and safety. And then comes the long-term cost. Operating a nuclear carrier means decades of reactor maintenance, crew training, and decommissioning at the end of its life, all extremely expensive compared to conventional ships. Some Chinese analysts even warn that chasing nuclear carriers could become a money sinkhole, draining resources that could otherwise go to submarines, hypersonic missiles, or space programs. But here's the twist. Beijing has shown time and again that it's willing to pay big for prestige projects, whether it's the world's fastest trains, giant dams, or space stations. A nuclear carrier isn't just about military power. It's about proving China belongs in the same league as the U.S., and that's where strategy comes in. Because the question isn't just can China build it, it's why does China want it in the first place? So why does China want a nuclear carrier at all? The answer really depends on how you see its global ambitions. On one hand, nuclear carriers are the ultimate symbol of power projection. They say we can go anywhere, stay as long as we want, and strike when we choose. For Beijing, that sends a clear message not just to Washington, but to every country along its trade routes, from the South China Sea to the Indian Ocean and even the Mediterranean. But critics argue nuclear carriers might not fit China's real strategy. Beijing has invested heavily in carrier killers. Long-range missiles like the DF-21D and DF-26 designed to target U.S. carriers. If China believes those weapons make American carriers vulnerable, why spend billions building its own giant floating targets? Some analysts suggest the answer is prestige. A nuclear carrier isn't just a weapon, it's a statement. It puts China in an exclusive club with only one other member, the United States. No other country operates a nuclear-powered carrier. France has one, but it's much smaller. Russia tried, but its program collapsed. If China succeeds, it joins America at the very top. So the debate isn't just about ships. It's about how China sees itself on the world stage. Does it want to focus inward, defending its coastlines with missiles and submarines? Or outward sailing nuclear carriers to show it's a true global superpower? And if China does choose the carrier path, there's one country watching more closely than anyone else, the United States. If China launches a nuclear-powered carrier, the first nation to feel the pressure is the United States. The U.S. Navy has operated nuclear carriers for over half a century. Its 11 supercarriers form the backbone of American global power. They patrol every ocean, respond to crises within days, and act as floating bases for fighter jets, bombers, and surveillance planes. No other country has matched this capability, yet. For Washington, a Chinese nuclear carrier isn't just another ship. It's a challenge to U.S. dominance at sea. It means the U.S. can no longer assume its carriers will always arrive first, stay longer, and operate farther from home. Suddenly, China could keep pace in ways that conventional carriers never allowed. This raises difficult questions for American strategy. Should the U.S. double down on its own carriers, pouring billions more into Ford-class ships? Or should it shift focus to other technologies, like long-range bombers, submarines, or hypersonic missiles, to counter China's rise? Already, American military planners are gaming out scenarios. What happens if a Chinese nuclear carrier sails into the Indian Ocean, docking in Pakistan or Sri Lanka? Or if it shows up in the Middle East, where U.S. carriers traditionally dominate? That would be more than symbolism. It would be a real shift in power balance. And the stakes are even bigger than U.S.-China rivalry. Because if China sails a nuclear carrier, every other navy in the world will have to rethink its place in the global order. A Chinese nuclear carrier wouldn't just shake Washington. It would send ripples across the entire world. Take India, for example. Right now, India operates two conventional carriers, but both are limited in range and endurance. If China launches a nuclear carrier capable of operating deep in the Indian Ocean, New Delhi will feel the pressure to respond, likely by accelerating its own nuclear naval ambitions. In Europe, France would suddenly lose its unique position as the only non-U.S. operator of a nuclear-powered carrier. 
the French Navy's Charles de Gaulle is smaller and older, and a Chinese supercarrier would instantly overshadow it. That could push Europe closer to the U.S. for security guarantees. In Asia, smaller powers like Japan, South Korea, and Australia would have to rethink defense budgets. None of them operate large carriers, but if Chinese nuclear carriers start patrolling near their waters, they may lean harder on alliances with Washington or invest more in submarines and long-range missiles to counterbalance. And then there's Russia. Once proud of its carrier program, Moscow has struggled for decades with its lone, aging Admiral Kuznetsov. Watching China succeed where Russia failed could push the Kremlin to deepen naval cooperation with Beijing, or conversely, feel threatened by being overshadowed even in its own backyard. In short, a single Chinese nuclear carrier could reshape not just naval warfare but the balance of power in regions stretching from the Pacific to the Mediterranean. But even if China builds the carrier, one critical question remains. Can it actually operate it the way the U.S. does? Building a nuclear carrier is one thing. Operating it at full strength is another story entirely. The U.S. Navy didn't master carrier warfare overnight. It took decades of practice, combat experience, and global logistics to perfect the system. A carrier isn't just a ship, it's the centerpiece of a carrier strike group, surrounded by destroyers, submarines, and supply ships. All of them must coordinate seamlessly across thousands of miles. China is still learning this. Its current carriers have made progress, but operating a nuclear-powered supercarrier will demand far more. Crews must be trained not just to launch and recover jets, but to sustain round-the-clock flight operations in any weather, anywhere in the world. That requires years of practice, endless drills, and the kind of real-world deployments the U.S. has been running since World War II. Then there's logistics. The U.S. has a global network of bases, allies, and refueling stations that let its carriers operate across every ocean. China doesn't, yet. It has one overseas base in Djibouti and relies on friendly ports, but a nuclear carrier will force it to expand that network dramatically if it wants true global reach. And finally, there's combat. No Chinese carrier has ever seen real war. The U.S. Navy, by contrast, has used carriers in conflicts from Vietnam to Iraq. Experience matters. Without it, China's new nuclear carrier risks being an impressive symbol, but an untested weapon. Which brings us to the big picture. What does all this mean for the future of naval power and the future of China's rise? The race for nuclear carriers isn't really about ships. It's about the future of power at sea and who will control it. For the United States, carriers have been the ultimate tool of dominance for nearly 80 years. Wherever a crisis erupted, from the Persian Gulf to the Pacific, a U.S. carrier was there. That unmatched mobility is what made America the world's leading superpower. Now China is stepping onto that stage. If it succeeds with nuclear carriers, it won't just close the gap. It could force the world into a new era of naval competition. We'd see not just missiles and submarines shaping strategy, but rival carrier groups patrolling oceans from Africa to Latin America. Some experts believe the future might not belong to giant carriers at all. With the rise of hypersonic missiles, drone swarms, and space-based surveillance, massive carriers could become too vulnerable to justify their cost. Others argue the opposite, that nothing replaces the psychological and practical impact of a floating airbase that can move anywhere without asking for permission. For China, the decision is both strategic and symbolic. A nuclear-powered carrier would show the world that Beijing isn't just a regional power. It's a true global naval force, capable of projecting strength far beyond its shores. And for the rest of the world, it means preparing for a new reality, a future where the seas are no longer dominated by one navy, but contested by two superpowers, locked in a high-stakes game of presence, prestige, and power. So the question isn't just when China will launch its first nuclear carrier, but what kind of world will set sail once it does?